Hey, Mitch. Oh, hey, Ed. What's up? Hey, hey. Can you believe it's been 40 years since Star Trek II was released? Oh, I'm a huge Trekkie. I love Star Trek II. Oh, me too. I think it's awesome. And uh, I certainly wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of this. I know. Cool. Well, you know, the Wrath of Corn. No, Khan. Corn. Khan. Corn. Khan. That doesn't make any sense. It's a Wrath of Corn. Besides, you know, you don't want to make this thing angry. Why? It's just a stupid vegetable. What could it possibly do? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Hi, this is Ed Dollister. This is Mitch Halleck. And welcome to another exciting episode of Mitch and Ed's Excellent Adventure. If it's your first time here, thanks for stopping by. If you are a regular viewer, thank you so much for coming back. We've got a great show for you today with a classic Star Trek movie that sort of reinvigorated the franchise. But before we begin, what can you do to uh, find out a little bit more about our show and what we've got in store, Mitch? Oh, and it is as easy as inserting the Genesis device into the center of a dead planet and bring it back to life. All you have to do is hit the subscribe button right down there and you'll be notified when Mitch and Ed go on another excellent adventure. And why not hit the like button to say, I like to live long and prosper with Mitch and Ed. Star Trek II, baby, the wrath of corn. I mean, con. That's right. The Wrath of Khan. It came out in 1982 and it was sort of a make or break film for the Star Trek franchise. If uh, people of my, my wife, Kelly's going, how come you're doing Star Trek two and not Star Trek, the motion picture. And you know what? Mm. We will get to Star Trek. The mo I, I like the Star Trek, the motion picture. Yeah, I do. The director's too. cut is fantastic. Mm. And we'll probably talk about that at some other point, but in well, case let's start with the best and work our way down. I think that's good. I, I think that's a good idea. Star Trek 2. So basically, Star Trek, the motion picture came out in 1979. Mm. It made money. It, the mm. visual effects were fantastic by Douglas Trumbull. The mm. music was great, but mm. it was rather long. And uh, let's, how can we say this politely? Some people found it a little bit boring. Yeah, I saw it in the theaters on Christmas Day. Yes. And my dad fell asleep and my buddy was like bored out of his mind. And I was loving it because I grew up loving Star Trek. But even I had to like, yeah, the ship looked nice. Yep. You know, but even the fact that they didn't have the original music bugged me when I saw it. I was like, hey, what's this? This this theme song. This isn't the original Star Trek theme song. What are those outfits they have on? They're horrible. So I got to admit. I was a little skeptical when Star Trek II came about, but I'm going to tell you the trailer for this movie sold it because mm -hmm. I remember being in the theater with my dad and we saw, I think it was Raiders because that was 81. Yes. And yes. Raiders played forever. And they showed the trailer for this movie. And it, it, it was like in the whole galaxy, there's one man who is the source of revenge or something like that. And it's, it's William Shatner silhouetted. You didn't see who it was yet. And they cut to Ricardo Montalban doing that speech. Is like, from hell's heart, I stab at thee. I will chase him around the moons of whatever. And then slowly it got the reveal that it was Kirk. And it said, you know, James T. Kirk. And they said, join him for the, I think they said a faithful mission of the Enterprise. I can't remember the exact dialogue, but it was one of those real dramatic, you know, Don Fontaine, like Star Trek II, The Wrath yes. of Khan, this summer at a theater near you. And my dad said, oh, we let's go see that because it looks so cool, this whole revenge story. And, you know, mm -hmm. Ricardo Montalban was obviously a fixture on TV and movies, so you knew who he was. And, yeah, it, got, it really got people excited again to see a Star Trek movie after the big, long, over-bloated Star Trek, the motion picture. So, yeah. It And that's exactly what it did. It reinvigorated the franchise and it was sort of a bit of a make or break thing. They, um, after not, a, it wasn't a debacle Star Trek again, no, it, was, motion it, picture, it, it did well. It didn't make fact, a fan. Let's just say no. that it wasn't making fans. And uh, I think it, it lacked the spirit of the original series. And I think that's what the uh, producers in Paramount well, thought when the film had come out. Um, 
you know, it didn't have a real we... good villain. That's no, it that, was only that's... like an episode of the old show. It was like the Nomad episode where there was like this probe that came back from outer space that was looking to find its creator, which is kind of like what happened in the movie. So mm-hmm. you're like, I kind of saw this already. And, you know, and they rushed the movie. There was a strike and I, I can't remember all the details, but they didn't get to finish it in time. And Robert Wise, brilliant director, didn't really get to do the version he wanted. The effects were rushed because they literally put that movie out i mean the, the from my heard stories that the film was still dripping wet from being in the the dissolve you know the process and all that yes. they're trying to get the reels of film out to the theaters in time because paramount had so much money invested in this star trek picture that they again uh, you know and because of pretty much star wars you know they were going to do star yeah. trek phase two the tv series that ended yep. up being yep. scrapped and then they fast-tracked star trek the motion picture you know, came out two years later, a huge film, three hours, uh, you know, close to three hours. It's a, it's a, it's a long epic. Yeah. And um, after it did well, but not so well, basically the producer yeah. said, okay, how can we make uh, Star Trek for cheaper? So they spoke to um, Harv Bennett. This, well, uh, no, go back a bit. Gene oh, yeah, Roddenberry, sure. he had an idea for a Star Trek two sequel. Oh, which now had is this, before. hang on. Is this, I bet you didn't know this about Star Trek two. Go for it. The fact that he wanted them to go back in time to stop the Kennedy assassination. I had and that as story, I saw it, yes. And in his story, at the end, Mr. Spock becomes the trigger man and actually pulls the trigger and kills Kennedy because they can't stop time. And they were like, what? No, we're not having Mr. Spock kill John F. Kennedy. Get the hell out of here. So they conveniently made Gene Roddenberry what they call a suitcase producer, where they gave him a lot of money. And they put his name up on the credits and they said, we'll see you later. And now they bring in Harv Bennett, yep. who had a yep. track record of TV show. I think he even was involved with the man from Atlantis, wasn't he? Maybe that, that sounds, was one of the shows. That sounds yeah. vaguely familiar. If you want to watch a little bit about the man from Atlantis, click up here. Or just yeah. But anyway, so yeah, uh, Roddenberry was out of the picture. They brought in Harv Bennett. They said, look, we got to make this. We got to make it you know, lean. Get it under production, get it on time, get it on schedule. You can't fool around with this stuff. So, and essentially, like it. Star Trek, I think it cost $42 million. Yeah, the it was pricey. Yeah. And uh, Harv Bennett said, I can make four Star Trek films on that uh, for that Pretty budget. much. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. they came in, I think, about 11 or $12 million for the budget of Star Trek II. As a result, they had to do some cost cutting. So they had to yeah. reuse sets, they reused some shots. From Star yep. Trek, the motion picture, uh, their uniforms uh, were dyed a different color. Um, oh, this yeah. is the first time we see the fantastic uh, costume design with those wonderful, you know, blood red tunes. Yeah, they had that nice and the turtlenecks. Coat. Yeah, with the flap over there. Yeah, like it was more military looking. It was that, that, and that's one thing that um, Gene that. Roddenberry didn't uh, really like. He was trying to move away from that mil- militaristic sort of. Um, mm. thing, whereas um, the director and the the writers um, wanted to um. Uh, embed the uh, story with a little bit more of it being like a naval adventure, a bit like a Horatio. Yeah, a submarine battle. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah, got that, you know, you got that really high tech whistle that you see the bosun. Yeah, uh, using. Them, yeah the bosun whistle. Yep, yep. Yes, and things like that. So they, re- yeah, they reused a lot of the sets. It was difficult to film against. So basically, what yeah, they did is yeah. they sliced it up and redressed it so they could move things around. Um, yeah. They reused a lot of. Uh, did you know that uh, Kirk's uh, apartment was original it was also spock's apartment just redressed they did a lot of things where they reused things but to be I honest i know the millennium i know the millennium falcons in that scene well i didn't know that in one of the buildings in the background of san francisco the millennium falcon is stood on its side and lit and it's one of the uh apartment buildings well okay i bet Somewhere you didn't the- know that the backdrop um when uh kirk is looking Wait. out his sorry logan logan's run no the towering inferno when looking out i did not know that so they so that they used that inferno. and then they used um they put some you know like a uh, higher tech you know more modern bi- buildings in the front but they use that as their main backdrop ah. I bet you didn't know that's what? the subject. That's the title of this show. Bet yeah, you didn't is. know this about Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, that the opening scene 
where Kirk and Spock are walking down the hall after they just do the Kobayashi Maru test, yes. you'll see this large globe structure in the foreground and this other uh, sculpture. That's not there. That's not on a set. That's actually forced perspective. They just filmed those two actors on a stage. And there's just like they did with a map painting, the uh, director of photography literally just picked up like, you know, this mouse and put it in the like that yep. real up yep. close. So it kind of gave that look of a big sculptured piece. But in reality, it was a little tiny globe like this. It was just altered on the film. So, I actually I did not know that. I did I not didn't. know that. Yeah, that's so, why we're calling. So, um, so with Harv Bennett on board, um, they got the original cast. I know Star, um, that uh, William Shatner was, you know, a bit concerned about playing a um, like an older character. You know, he was he was yeah. actually, I think, he was fifty at the time, and it's yeah. quite funny. The whole the whole story is about, you know, I suppose, you know, aging and. Uh, you, among many other things, but you know, your, your usefulness and what is your use by date? No, it was funny. Cause I watched it um, the day after my 52nd birthday uh, last week to recap and captain Kirk is actually um, having his, it's his 52nd birthday in the, in the series. And, you know, he's, there's um, basically he was convinced by director Nicholas Meyer about, no, we can, we can show you how you can age gracefully. And they had little yeah. nods to it with, um, you know, his glasses and not being able to yeah, see yeah. and, and all those sort of taking him a desk, you know, he's really taking a desk job at the moment. And you see yep. after the events of Star Trek, the motion picture that, you know, the, the, uh, the crew are not all together. You've got Chekhov on the USS Reliant. Grissom. No, um, the Grissom. No, he's on the Reliant. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. The Grissom Star Trek Three. You're right. Yes, yes that's he's on okay. the Reliant. The script. Um, it was essentially leaked that Spock was going to die in it because this was yeah. really the only way to get Leonard Nimoy, Leonard Nimoy back. back. If you know, if he could uh, die, and then there was yeah. uh, hate mail sent to Paramount oh, yeah. saying if you know about this. So. Uh, Nicholas Meyer then leaked back a few things that, well, he might die, he might survive and everything like that. But what they did this is they- before the internet, which is crazy. Oh, yes. This so is they, back in the early 80s. They don't have an internet then. This is just No, word but of things mouth. were getting stolen from that set all the time, yeah. ID passes and things like that. So what yeah. they did during the Koyabashi Mar Maru test at the yeah. uh, start is they killed off Spock. Spock. An explosion. In, yeah. the, in the explosion in it. So that uh, the audience, when they go see it for the first time, will go, ah, oh, that's what it was. You know, it and was just fact, the I remember the audience because I saw it on opening day. I went and see it. And I remember the audience laughing at the line because William Shatner, Captain Kirk comes into the room and Spock's laying there on the ground after they just the simulation. And he gets up, he goes, aren't you dead? And yes. the audience laughed because the, all the fanboys back then, we'd all lurk around the comic book shops and the comic book conventions in the day, sci-fi conventions. And that's how we all talked. You yes. know, literally it was word of mouth. And we all knew, oh, oh in Starlog magazine, it says he's going to die. So we all kind of knew that. And then when you hear it was fake, you kind of did that. Oh, it was just a, a ruse, a misdirection type of thing. Yes. So, yeah, they, they were playing into the uh, the leaks and such that were abound at the time. So And yeah. um, so, as you said earlier, the, the thing that Harv Bennett uh, thought of is that uh, Star Trek, the motion picture, didn't have a a main villain and he had never really seen any star trek he thought that film was boring so what he did is he watched all 79 episodes of I know. star trek the original series and um one thing that stuck to him was ricardo montalban as khan nunian singh in the space seed which is a, mm -hmm. a great episode and he thought i wonder if we can get ricardo montalban back to play this character and thankfully did he did a, a an amazing job as Khan and it was a good tie-in but you didn't necessarily need to know no. you know the history too much you just knew that there was history between Kirk um did you know that uh you probably did but when you think back to the film you go oh there's so much interaction between Khan and uh Kirk but they actually never, never share that. a scene yeah. together yeah they're all no. on view screens because um, Ricardo Montalban was so busy uh, with uh, Fantasy, Fantasy Island. Island. Yeah. So he had to um, basically film all his, all his uh, scenes separately. But you sort of I, think, oh, no, they're together. But they're, they're well, not. Well, no, there was, there was one draft where there was going to be some like, cycle, uh, like a side battle between Kirk and Khan. 
like in like this mental telepathy. I don't know how you're going to describe it, but it was almost this otherworldly thing where their their consciousness were fighting each other. I don't know what they were going to do with that story. They threw that out. They were like, no, but that that was one plot line at one point that Kirk and uh, and Khan were supposed to fight in this mental plane of yes i don't know what the hell it was so yeah i'm glad they they decided to just do it like um submarine yeah. warfare instead um i yeah, think it worked yeah. it worked out really did you um, know yeah did you know that ricardo montalban was a famed actor of course but he was also a brilliant dancer but just like william shatner he was a huge horseman and he rode horses and he had a terrible fall from a horse and it injured his uh leg and stuff and he would walk with a cane and a lot of his scenes are filmed with him sitting down because he had a lot of trouble walking. And then years later, he would uh, digress and go into a wheelchair. So towards the end of his career, he was mostly, you know, wheelchair bound and didn't move around. So that might have also played into the fact mm -hmm. that they didn't have a physical you know, fight back and forth because he had some troubles with his legs. Yeah, I didn't know that. I did know that um, a lot of people thought that his chest because he's famous for his chest was fake, was yeah. a prosthetic, but it was no, real. That was 100% pure Montalban, rich Corinthian leather. Was that <laughs> those pecs? No, he, he was in shape. He was one oh, of those yes. deals. I mean, he wasn't like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, steroided out. He was just a guy that kept in shape and that was his real pecs. And yep. that was him. He was hot. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, that's how it is on SETI Alpha Five. It's uh, it was a pretty hot and uh, stormy, stormy place. Yeah. We it's make it's sure great... it's not SETI Alpha Six because we all know SETI Alpha blew up, and it oh, shifted was that the SETI, or did SETI Alpha Four? SETI Alpha blow up? Four. Yeah, one of them blew up, and that's why I'm thinking with all your technology aboard the Reliant, your science vessel, you're trying to find. You didn't notice that this the wrong planet but hey well, things happen you know. you know the other major major gaff in star trek 2 is that Chekhov never actually yeah never actually met um, walter Koenig wasn't on the series at that point and no he, he wasn't uh, really so he different. never actually met khan in the episode and uh they've they've said basically that um I think they tried to retcon it a little bit. That uh, I heard know, maybe a story that they came up with. Have you about the bathroom? Oh, that's what that's what um, Walter Koenig I think said to. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, share that. Yeah, one. The, the story is because yeah, you're right. The actors were never on the show at the same time, so they never could see each other. Because Khan says the line, "Mr. Chekhov, I never forget a face." Yes. The story yes. that they came up with is that he would tell on the con circuit, not the con, but the comic convention circuit, sci-fi conventions, is that. Uh, Khan had to use the facilities or the men's room and Chekhov was in there as well. And he had like a bad case of diarrhea or whatever. And he was trying to get in there to use the toilet and they had a scuffle. So he finally gets in there to use it. And they just looked at him and said, you, I'll never forget your face, yes. you know, to check off and such. So that's but, why, you know, they, they I think their own backstory about. Yeah. How, they, they also said that, um, uh, that uh, Chekhov was working like the night shift or whatever on um, yeah. uh, insecurity and they met during that time and they basically, Kirk was impressed and that's why. But you know what? I was just, during, during it doesn't really matter, but during the episode of the Space Seed, he goes to yeah. have, a, Khan looks at all the systems and is reading everything about the ship. Odds right. are he, with his superior intellect, during the um oh, you the know, eugenic wars the on eugenic the wars yeah. you know with his superior intellect i'm sure he probably memorized everyone that was on that the ship, crew manifest. Uh, the crew yeah. and then go yeah. that's why i remember you i think you know sure yeah. that sounds plausible it does it's more or, plausible you know what else could it, you know what else it could have been ed what it was in the script okay yes that's it good. could yes true anyway so, back to star trek we also yeah. introduced the new characters played by Kirstie Alley, who yes. was on board. She was half Romulan, half Falcon. Though I don't think they ever mentioned she's- They didn't. They Romulan. did that in deleted scenes. That's why you saw oh, her okay. cry at yeah. the end of- uh, Yeah, because I was like, why is a Vulcan crying? And then I'm like, well, she's got half you know, Romulan and such, so. Yeah, so she was a little bit more emotional. That's why she did a few things. Uh, she was uh, shocked when she saw- You mean uh, Scotty's nephew? 
Yeah, Scotty's nephew. Yeah, when you saw him, who I remember from now, wasn't he from Escape from Witch Mountain? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. The Disney. Well, I, he also looks a lot like Haley Joel, not Haley Joel Osmond. Um, James uh, Earl Haley, the guy I'm thinking. Oh of yes, Jack, the, uh, J- uh, Jackie. Jackie Earl Haley. He looks yes. like that a little bit. They too, were no, uh, they right. were they were child actors around the same time. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, it wasn't English again yeah. deleted scene. It wasn't explained that that was his uh, nephew, but you did find out, and that's why Kirsty Alley's character was uh, a yeah. little shocked when he brought him in. Uh, to yep. you know, when he never he yeah, never, was, um, uh, ran away. Yeah, when the door yeah. opens and Scotty's carrying his uh, hurt body there. Yeah. Did you, yeah. did you know that, um, well, Star Trek two we alluded to it earlier, had many different titles. It was originally going to yeah. be um, War of the Engine. Generations. It was going to be yeah. subtitled. The, the Undiscovered Genesis. Country. The un- yeah, the, which the- Nicholas Meyer, the director, obviously went on to uh, direct Star Trek six, yeah. uh, The Undiscovered no, Country. Do- oh, yeah, you know, he, yeah, he was there. Um, he also, um, uh, it was also going to be called Star Trek two the vengeance of Khan, but they right. changed that because around that time there was revenge right. of the Jedi coming out and they thought, yeah. no, we don't want to have that get confused with yeah. uh, Star Trek Star Wars. Pictures, yeah. revenge. It'll confuse people because they're stupid. So yeah. we'll change it, Mr. Lucas. And then what's George Lucas do? Change yeah. it. Return, return but that's okay. I think the wrath of Khan is a lot better yeah. than the vengeance of Khan. Sort the of. Grapes of uh, wrath of Khan. Yeah. Yeah. It's a so, bit more of, it's a bit more theatrical, the wrath. It does. It sounds like, you know, Crystal Skull, you know, that type of thing. Like a, I think like so. A, I, I quite, I quite yeah, like it. Like very um, dramatic type of thing. Did you know that yes. um, most of Khan's uh, people um, back on SETI Alpha 5, when uh, obviously the Botany Bay um, was there, there was their planet yeah. blew up his wife yes. um, from the episode um, they were going to get her back. Unfortunately, the original actress was suffering from uh, MS, so I she wasn't able to. Um, she wasn't able to uh, reprise. I her always role, wondered but they, why. They, I thought they just wrote her off to you know as part well, of. Well, the they story did else. say that my wife was killed by the uh, SETI eels. Eel. You know that. Yeah. Um, that they did. Um, but did you know most of um, his crew, the um, Khan's crew, were Chippendales? Really. Correct. I did not know. I could tell you this. Yeah. I know that one of them went on to be in a lot of science fiction movies. It was Judson Scott. The thing of it is you wouldn't know because he's not credited in the entire movie because his agent said, no, we won't. We don't want to take a credit in this one. But he was Joaquin. He was Car- he was Khan's number one. Yes, he, was like, he does look familiar. He, he always appeared. Yeah, as a that's him. Guy. He was in the Phoenix. He was like in a ton of like a deep. What was it Sequest and all that stuff? He was in the eighties a lot and a lot yep. of sci-fi. You know, Judson Scott, but he is not credited at all in Star Trek Two: The Wrath of Khan. Yeah, even though he's got yep. a good part. Oh, Agent he's got a great that, part. Yeah, um, I there. I love that scene from uh seti alpha five with the uh the uh seti eels that go into yeah. the ear i know that they yeah. um in the original cut they had to change it a little bit because it looked so gross when it was coming out yeah but yeah there's a great i don't know if you've got um cinema fantastic this fantastic. i remember cinema yes i do have those this yes. is um they this was um a double cover because they used to have um blade runner on one version and yeah. this is the star trek two but they've got a great shot in here but can you yeah. see how they did a giant? Yeah, they made a giant mold of Walter Koenig's ear. Yeah. And they just, it was just a little puppet. That's how yes. they pulled it off. Yeah. With some fantastic. And I bet you didn't know this. Maybe you did. That uh, Paramount painted and patented the design for the SETI eels for a toy. Patented. Oh, well, we say patented. Well, you say a lot of weird things in Australia. But yeah, <laughs> kids wanted to have a toy of that. Hey, well, kids. they didn't do anything with it, but they did ear. patent the idea. Oh, well, I'm glad they didn't get the patent for that one. Anyways, anyways, and I suppose the main thing, I mean, the wonderful thing about Star Trek 2 is mm-hmm. um, the acting. Look, the acting is fantastic. I think it's got some of the best acting in any Star it Trek It does, film. actually. No, no. And you said earlier, like I saw this when I was a kid. I saw this 82, so I had to be like 14 years old saw it with my dad and it works on a lot of levels i'm going to tell you it works as a cool adventure yeah uh, like you said like a you know, submarine versus a ship uh type of like like a hunt for red october even though that'll be years yep. run silent run deep 
is yes. what I'm thinking. And there was also an old Star Trek episode where they fought the Romulans for the first time and they couldn't, it was like they were feeling each other out. It was this whole naval battle thing, you know? So that's, it works on that level. It's a good action movie. If you don't even know Star Trek, you can walk into this movie and figure out what's going on and, mm -hmm. and enjoy the picture. But on all the other levels too, like you said, at the end when Kirk's realizing how he's old and then we can jump to the end, he goes, I feel young. He gets that new lease on life and, you know, he loses his friend and all that mm -hmm. stuff there too. So as an older viewer now, I watch that movie with different eyes and go, oh, yeah. you know, he's yeah. not out to pasture. He's not like, done for he's got you know years left ahead of him he's still useful you yes. know and that's yes. that that plays into the whole rebirth type of thing of genesis which is you know life from death as they say in the movie it is so and we works. should we should point out the amazing uh, cgi sequence by uh ilm rather and early uh, pixar. pixar yeah correct yeah um the for the genesis project which was this amazing fractally yeah. generated us uh, which still looks you know it's quite it's no quite it looks good to this day no but i remember seeing that in the movies like how did they do that because it was yeah. like it was animated but it did look animated you know but mm. yeah that was all new technology back in the day and we forgot to, we didn't get uh the rest of the cast their credit paul winfield who i knew from a movie called sounder with cicely okay. tyson that i saw in the 70s it's a family they have a dog and all that stuff. But Paul Winfield plays uh, Tyrell, which I always think of Blade Runner because Tyrell Corporation yes. was the name of the place that made the replicants. And I'm like, is that a coincidence that they named Captain Tyrell? I don't know. I mean, same year, same stuff. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, so he was the captain of the Reliant. And also on his crew, I was going to say there was another actor, but I'm jumping ahead. Uh, to one of the other Star Trek movies down the road. Some of the, the crew members there. I'm thinking of Christian Slater, but he doesn't show up till number six. That's correct. But uh, B.B. Besh, who's an actress that they picked to play Dr. Carol Marcus, creator yes. of the Genesis device, who was also Kirk's love interest from years ago and also the mother of his child that yes. we find out, was played by Bibiana Besh. That's her full name. Mm -hmm. Did you know? She came from Austria, came over with her family and acted early on in her career, went to the Connecticut School of Women College right here in New London, Connecticut, and is also the mother of actress Samantha Mathis. There you go. And she's also a great actress. She was on other things. She also played the mother of Janine Turner's character on Northern Exposure years okay. later on. Unfortunately, she passed away at age 56 from uh breast cancer i believe but she was a uh, a very nice addition to the star trek cast unfortunately never comes back though they don't bring Why? her back for star trek three they don't bring her back for four they don't even really mention her again and sadly too merit obviously when you look at star trek two most of this cast i hate to say it is passed away except yes. for like three people except for kirk Chekhov, and sulu mm -hmm. and kirstie alley Everybody else has passed on. I mean, years earlier, Paul Winfield died years ago. B.B. Yes. Besh died. Merritt Bat Buttrick, I believe his name was, was yes. one of the yes. earlier uh, AIDS victims at yes. the time. Yes. He was on a show called Square Pegs with Sarah Jessica Parker. He was the star of that. It was about these nerdy kids in uh, high school. Yep. And I remember yep. him from that. He was this big, tall, blonde guy that wore these sunglasses. And he actually does appear on an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation season one as this drug addicted uh colonist or something like that and this this planet was addicting their population with drugs he comes on he's also on star trek one more time before he passes away but a nice young actor mm -hmm. uh you know did a terrific job as playing uh david yes you know yes. marcus kirk's son there that was another addition to the thing you know the kirk that had, he had a family yeah you know you never thought of captain kirk with uh anybody more than one episode you know he's jump from bed to bed but no he actually had a uh, a love interest yeah so that was kind of cool to find out too you know and of course we had the uh amazing ending where spock spoiler alert does does die yes. by saving the show actually i should i i'll just quickly go back you know the reliant how it looks yeah. quite different to uh the enterprise um the main reason for that is when um, Harve Bennett uh, okayed the uh, design of it, he was actually looking at it upside down. And that's why yeah. the nacelles are 
on the bottom as opposed to the top. But the other reason is they wanted a way to how can you make it look like uh, you can, the audience can tell the difference between the two ships, I think. Because, because um, actually in the script, they were the same ships. Yeah. They were both the, uh, the same Constitution uh, class ships. They had to change yep. that in special effects. But yeah. the actual, yeah. if you read the actual script, they're like, oh no, they're the same class of ships. So, yes, and that is such a great them. in that in that nebula, and you've got you know yeah, when it's yeah, the when the lasers nebula. are shooting that, and there's some yeah. spectacular visual effects that still hold up today. You know, uh, an amazing job by ILM, as you would expect. Oh, and I got to tell you too, when this movie got released overseas, over in England, I know it got an, uh, a 15 rating because of the violence. When they when they beam down to the planet to look for, you know, Carol Marcus and the rest yes. of them. And they find him through dead. There's a lot of blood and such, you know, when they find it the was actually the, on the, yeah. The 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 bodies. Split. Yeah. 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 Regular one, the, the, hmm. the space station. Did you know the space station regular one was the same model they used in star Trek, the motion picture, but just flipped, flipped upside, upside down. down. Yep, yeah. I did know that There's more money that way. Yeah. See, and they read the whole shot of the uh, ship leaving dry dock was just repurposed from, Star Trek, the motion. And picture. the same with the, his uh, Kirk shuttle when there was approaching yeah. them, they did. But, yeah. you know, I mean. And did you know that that whole effect with the Mutara Nebula was just a big uh, fish tank full of water with some. <laughs> Spock. Guys. Spock. And He's already just, dead. He's already you know, dead. That's all. The... <laughs> He's dead already. That's, that's how they got all the, the cloud effect in there. Yeah, was just they just poured like milky. They were pretty good with those ink tanks back then. I think they, uh, you know, before. Uh, no, but they uh, used that effect somewhat. They kind of used that in um, uh, Raiders Flash Lost Ark. No, 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 Raiders Lost Ark. When they have oh, for the, this, uh, yeah, when he's opening, yeah, the clouds. Yeah, the demons that come out of the Ark of the Covenant. They just pull them through water, and you get that like effect with everything. And they also use it in Poltergeist, which is going to come out as the same well. Yeah, eighty-two was a good year. Um, no, those guys at ILM, they were cooking, man. They were. And of course, and we Star had... Trek. What, wait, Star Trek was the first time ILM worked on an outside movie other than Star Wars. They were like hired out. Uh, well, no, 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 because they worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark. No, well, it, outside of Lucasfilm. I'm okay, saying, gotcha. Yeah. Just they clarifying. We'll get, we'll get right. emails yes, yes, otherwise. Yes. Um, no, no, no. They, they got hired to uh, work outside of Lucasfilm. Yeah. And that was the first project they did. So... Um, just let's go before we go to uh, merchandise and things like that um, and uh, how it went. Uh, the uh, the ending, of course, is with the death of Spock, where he um, basically um, saves saves the ship, um, mm. but is mortally wounded. Oh, and did you know about Khan's baby? Oh, now I heard there's something a, about Khan's yeah, baby. Yeah, no, there's okay. there, it's, there's. Did you know there's scenes. They filmed of the small child walking around the Reliant or something. They just cut that all out of the movie. They're like, let's not get into this. But there's a scene when the uh, Genesis device is overheating in the uh, the transporter room. It's about to go out. There's a scene, this little kid in these ragged clothes who looks like he's some Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome type of thing or the feral kid walking towards it. Khan's baby is like walking towards that explosion. I don't know what they were thinking about that. Like, well, yeah, we're going to have Khan have a baby. You know, not him physically, but obviously, like he could do it. He could do his it. offspring from his wife. But yeah, I'm like, good thing they kind of threw that story out because then you're yes. kind of like, well, Kirk's blown up a ship with a little kid on board. You know, that's kind of dark. You know, but anyway, yes, they threw that scene in there. But Leonard Nimoy, who wanted a death scene, actually had second thoughts when they were filming it and said, you know, maybe I don't want to get killed off. Maybe so I let's 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 do this with McCoy. Let's do this little remember, which gives yeah. him a little bit of an out. But certainly, after the fact, when um, the test audiences they decided to um, film an additional scene on the on yeah. the Genesis planet, which was yeah. actually filmed in Golden Gate Park in um, San Francisco, San Francisco, with uh, the uh, torpedo tube or the the R four torpedo, yeah, you know, with uh, with Spock in it, you know, which gave them obviously this, you know, Star Trek three, the search for Spock. But that's a fantastic scene with that amazing, you know, the amazing, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Yeah, um, it's quite an emotional, emotional scene uh, there with the just because they can't get to each other between that plexiglass. I'll tell you that plexiglass thing bugs me now because years later, 
if you watch it, there's seams in between the, the glass. Like, wait a minute, if that radiation, you could go right out through that little, little crack there. But anyway, I know it takes away from it. But every time I watch it, though, I notice there's a, there's a seam in between the two things. You know what else I noticed when I watched that scene? The mm -hmm. background extra who's oh. way overacting. Okay, there's one who just is about? there to hold back um, Kirk, I think, and then he just leaves, which is quite funny. No, no, there's that. But when they're doing the whole, uh, you know, I have been and always shall be your friend, when they're doing that, that little scene between the two of them, look behind Kirk. Okay. And there's a, 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 a an engineer in a white uh, jumpsuit like Scotty has, and he's just like, you know, doing this like, oh, I'm so hurt. I'm overheated. He's really distracting Acting. upstaging i've he's, never he's old, i've, I've, I've been just it. so focused on the two actors i've no never no no well, i'm telling you watch that scene again and once i point that out you can't get your eyes off and you're like did someone not tell this guy to stop upstaging the main actors because let me tell you i was good at upstaging when i used to do plays years ago i got yelled at all the time by the directors because i'd be the background guy and i'd i would be doing something it's like will uh, you stop you're that guy me? i'm that guy Look at me, everybody. Forget the leads. Look at maybe, me. I'm maybe the... you could get you could find him out and get him as a guest at Terrificon. I could. I could. So there you go. So and film, did you yeah. know they did not want to play Amazing Grace at the end. No, that. and that's where um James Doohan suggested what about um, Scott um bagpipes. Yeah, playing it on bagpipes. So he's not yeah. actually playing it. Um but nah. um, yeah. yeah. But yeah. No, but yeah, that wasn't part of the original scene. Because they're like, you're not going to do that, are you? So, yeah. And then That's when Kirk gets choked up, when he does, you know, of all the souls I've ever encountered, yeah. his was the most <laughs> human. That for Clem thing, I use that in a communications class doing a speech in college. William Shatner acting. I got to admit, Shatner, who gets bashed all the time for like being over overacting himself mm -hmm. and his delivery and the way his cadence is, He's he's this is probably his best performance out of all the things I've seen him in. This Star Trek Two is probably the best performance as Captain Kirk. Anyway, yep, uh, I agree, and uh, I know that James Doohan wanted to get uh, thought that Ricardo Montalban should have got an Academy Award nomination for his he's role good as well. As Khan, yeah. he is very good. You know, they're so committed, and again, you know, when you're acting against nothing, essentially, right. Um, right. it's uh, it's pretty amazing. So the film came out. It did. Um, big numbers. It was hugely successful. Yeah. It didn't make as much as Star Trek: The Motion Picture, but it was more profitable because it may it, it cost less to make. But surprisingly, after Mego had the license for um, Star Trek: The Motion Picture, there were no toys. Nothing. Um, I've, no comic books. I've There's got. No, um, yeah. I've got this. Okay, so I thought I'll do my due diligence and have a look through, and it goes from Star Trek: The Motion Picture to star trek 3 the search for spock yeah. where Ertel brought yeah. out the toys there wasn't yeah. anything there was no the novelization no. um nope. which was a bestseller by vonda mcintyre back on the vonda mcintyre yeah there were well, some what, books there was no, some marvel books. i was going to say marvel did an ongoing series after star trek the motion picture came yeah. out there was even a newspaper star trek comics a strip in the papers but when star trek 2 came Everyone had gotten burned so much from Star Trek merchandise not selling, like Happy Meal toys and all that stuff. They didn't yep. want it. So there's nothing for Star Trek 2. There's maybe, like you show the novelization. The soundtrack, I don't believe, even came out originally. It, it no, was like years later. Uh, well, James Horner. What, I think that's James Horner's first uh, movie It's soundtrack. his first major score. There's an ad for the score. Yeah. Yep. Atlantic records and cassettes. So it did come out. Yeah. Um, but there was nothing. They now they have now brought out um oh yeah, you know, years later they brought out a lot of things. Um currently Mego have got out Kirk and Spock from um Star Trek 2. I, mm -hmm. I was going to try and buy one for the show, but I couldn't I couldn't find one in time. No, in no, there, and I know, sent you a picture the other day. They've re the Funko, of course, Funko. They've got uh, Khan from the Spacey, the old episode. But yes, uh, Playmates, when they were doing the line of f action figures, when they did Star Trek Next Generation, all that, they did uh, Khan, Wrath of Khan figures because I remember they had the uh, open-chested Khan. 
and they've redone it since. I mean, it's they've got just... um they've got some coming out. I think it's like Star yeah. Trek, not Legends or whatever. But they've brought out Khan, Spock, and uh, Kirk um, from mm-hmm. Star Trek Two, which come out in October, I think... November. I think over, yeah, right around now, yeah. Um, yeah. and going back to Funko, they also brought out um they've got a one like a Funko movie scene of the uh, Kirk and Spock death the with glass, the glass, yeah, yeah, in the room. I don't have any gaps. Thing. No, but there has been a couple of versions of that soundtrack because it didn't have everything originally. I just saw one came out, I think, in 2015 or so. It had a more complete version of uh, all the uh, the soundtrack. Plus, talk about complete version. When this aired on TV, on ABC, just like they used to do with Superman, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of deleted scenes that ran for television that were not included in any of the uh, VHS or yep. the Blu-ray or the laser disc and stuff. I do believe the latest version that's come out now, there's a 4K, I think, yes. out there, has everything. Finally has all the deleted scenes we talked about with Kirstie Alley and, you know, Spock and Kirk and there was some other stuff because I remember watching it on TV and you go, oh, that's new. Oh, that scene's different. Oh, look, they and sometimes it's just a different take. Sometimes it's just a different angle, the same yep. scene, same dialogue but it's maybe a close-up shot as opposed to a wide shot and, you know, little subtle things, but there was some more to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really, uh, it's, I think it Star Trek two is a great, um, if you're not a Star Trek fan, you can still enjoy it. Um, It's, you know, some of the ones that get a little bit into the minutiae and um, Mm -hmm. you know all those, uh, you know, where you go, Oh, I've got to see. It's a bit like sometimes the Marvel films where you you can't enjoy it unless you've seen a bazillion other things. Well, you talk about, I was going to say, talk about not enjoying it. Star Trek Into Darkness, the second J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie, is a really wrong course remake of this movie. I don't know what they were thinking about. Yeah, with they Benedict Cumberbatch. As, Benedict uh, Cumberbatch, like having a big secret. Oh, is he really going to be Khan, Nooney, and Singh? I don't know why they bothered. I don't know yeah. why they made him Khan. He looks nothing. Well, he doesn't have to look him, but it was nothing about the Ricardo Montalban character. They kind of combined the episode of Space Seed from the original show with the Wrath of Khan in one movie where they find him and they find out that he's got all these people that escaped. And yeah. there was this war coming with Peter Weller. Uh, he wanted to have this type of guy because they needed somebody that was ruthless to help fight the Klingons or whatever they were going to do. It was all over the place. And at the end, they do the whole remake, except instead of Spock dying. It's Kirk dying, and they even do the whole you know needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, yeah. and you know uh, Chris Pine as Kirk sacrifices himself, and in one of the worst deliveries ever, Zach Quinto loses his crap as he's fighting Benedict Cumberbatch, and you know they tell him Kirk does it, and he does that like shatter, yeah. but he's there's no drama to it. It's pathetic. No. It's actually one of the worst parts of the movie. You almost cringe. You go, why? Why'd you do this? So if you want to see a good version of Star Trek 2, watch Star Trek 2. Do That's not right. watch the other Into Darkness because it's like, I, I don't even know what they were thinking when they go, we're going to remake Star Trek, The Wrath of yeah. Khan. Why? So, but anyway, yeah, I think, and Ricardo Montalban, you mentioned too, I think he really enjoyed this whole new audience that opened up to him. Um, you know, because again, yeah, he was super popular art. at the yeah. at the time with uh, Fantasy Island. They even they did a little robot that they brought onto the set with the face of Tattoo. Yeah, uh, which, I saw that. Yeah, which was yeah. pretty Perfect funny. Lines. So, yeah. Um, yeah, if you if you're able to uh, get the 4K version when it comes out, um, by all um the digital bits, I think have got a review on it saying it's it's spectacular. It's a, the definitive version, but mm-hmm. it's on streaming. Uh, there's still the uh. Uh, there's the Blu-ray director's cut uh, that is still available that you can get. Um, and it's a fantastic uh, movie. Uh, it's just, uh, it's got everything. So I certainly would recommend yeah. it. It was a bumpy year in 1982 and it is at the top or close to the top of what was released that year. You know what, Mitch, we've got lots of films from 1982 that uh, we've been yeah. looking at, but how can you find out a little bit more about those shows if you're not sure what to do? Oh, and it is just as easy as filing a proton torpedo into the Matara Nebula using your gut instinct and blowing something up. All you got to do 
is press the subscribe button down below and you can go check it out. Or as Ed just mentioned, we already have a bunch of shows there. Go to our page and go search through Blade Runner, The Last Starfighter, E.T., uh, E.T., Tron. We're like the 80s embodiment. We, If you saw in the 80s, it's on our show. Plus, we even go back in the 70s and look at the great disaster movies. We look at Jaws. We look at Star Wars and everything else that's back in the 70s as well. So what are you doing watching us? Go check out the rest of Mitch and Ed's excellent adventures, all available right now on YouTube. Subscribe, like us, notify yourself, beam yourself on board, do whatever you feel like doing. It. That's right. And if you've got a suggestion, like this was a suggestion for um, a show, write it in the comments below. Um, we always read all your comments and uh, really? we really appreciate you watching and uh, being part of the show as well. So signing off. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Dollister. I should say, if we're going uh, like uh, Mr. Sa you know, Mr. Savick. Uh, oh, we, we want to have do that. This yeah. is Ed Dollister. And this is Yeoman Mitch Halleck. Yo, man. Yo, man. I knew you were going to go there. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>